Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to Rebinge It. This is the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we are Rebinging Star Trek Voyager from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 1, Episode 13, Cathexis. This episode aired May 1st, 1995. I had to Google the title. Yes. Which is a little annoying. <laughs> and according to Google, cathexis is a term used to describe an investment of libidinal energy in an object or an idea. A sentimental <laughs> attachment to a keepsake or a family heirloom is an example of cathexis. In mm. psychoanalysis, it's defined as the process of allocation of mental or emotional energy to a person, object, or idea. I question whether that name is really apt for this episode. Well, yeah, it's like there's a little tiny piece of it. If I have to Google the title, I don't think it's good. You know what my name for this episode would be? What? Nebula of Paranoia. (laughs) That would have been good. That sounds like a Doctor Who episode. Yeah, it does. I would have preferred it to Cathexis, whatever the (laughs) hell. Well, before we get into this episode, which, by the way, thank God we never say the word cathexis, or we don't say it a bunch of times. Imagine how (laughs) annoying that would have been. (laughs) But do you have anything to say about last week's episode, Heroes and Demons? No, it was perfect. And this episode, I think, reinforced that Harry Kim is the Mars O'Brien of Voyager. If you've (laughs) got to pick on someone, it has to be Harry. Yeah, he has gotten into a lot of trouble. Even in this episode, he gets punched in the face. (laughs) <laughs> but he doesn't get kidnapped, and that's what matters. I'm picturing the writer's room, and they're like, oh, and then, you know, someone's going to get beaten up. Oh, yeah, it'll be Harry. It'll be Harry. I think at first it seemed like it was going to be Tom, but no, it's definitely Harry. He's the victim. <laughs> yeah. So should I get started? Yes, you have the notes this week. Over to you, Kim. In the cold open, Captain Janeway has decided to get away from being a captain in a hollow novel set in ancient England. When I saw this, I forgot how much I did not enjoy Janeway in her holodeck programs. Really, it's not really ancient England. It's more like the late 1800s. Well, to her, it's ancient. Oh, that is true. It's a stormy night in an old house, and we're all in hoop skirts and bonnets. Oh, my gosh. It's a period drama. Yeah. And we meet a particularly bossy woman who Janeway manages to outboss. Yep. And this woman, by the way, is played by Carolyn Seymour, who I recognized immediately as a Romulan. Turns out she (laughs) played two different Romulans on TNG. Wasn't she the Romulan in the episode, Deanna the Romulan? Yeah. I think she was the captain, wasn't she? Yeah, that was kind of cool. But we never see this character again, at least not in this episode. I don't know if she comes back later. Yeah. Well, this is not a good trade-off. I mean... (laughs) Maybe take care of some pets or something, but not children. That's not less stressful for so many reasons, especially in a time period where there's no real medical care. (laughs) Well, that is something. I mean, it does get easier because the chance of some of those kids dying is pretty high. That's true, I guess. Well, even though the scene is pretty useless, we do get a good Janeway eye roll here (laughs) that makes it all sort of worthwhile. I kept on thinking of those terrible books your mom reads. Yeah, yeah, this would fit. We don't have to endure this scene too long because Harry calls saying Tuvok and Chakotay's shuttlecraft has been picked up on long-range scanners and it's been badly damaged and they're not responding. So Janeway says to beam them to sickbay when they're in range. That holodeck scene lasted for four minutes and nine seconds. Only, I think, four minutes longer than it really needed to be. (laughs) Yeah, totally agree. Is it the fact that I'm interested in history that I don't get why people are interested in that time period? I mean, if we wanted it to be authentic... They should at least be one of the characters dying of cholera or perhaps TB. I mean, that was pretty popular back then. It's like there's this weird sort of romanticism about what was a truly appalling time period. Yeah, I know. I have some notes about this later as well. It almost makes sense if you become sort of obsessed with watching television shows or maybe movies set in that time period. Yeah. Uh, or even reading the crazy books that my mom reads, <laughs> where it has this weird sort of romanticism to it. But it's right. like, it was a dirty, disgusting time period. I remember listening to a podcast talking about the smells and how how there was no like <laughs> bathing in the aristocracy in, <laughs> in the UK. <laughs> the great London stink of, oh gosh, was the 18th? 1860s, 1850s? I'm going to have to look that up now. But there was once I mean, a time where they had a hot summer and London apparently smelt like death. 
Yes, that's what it's like, not what these people seem to think it's like. I mean, it's probably nice on the holodeck because it can handle all the smells, <laughs> right. right? And and there's yeah. there's maybe no problem with any sort of medical issues. But if yeah. it were going to be realistic, it would need to smell and half these people would be dead from something because they don't know what causes it. <laughs> I guess when you get so far away from that kind of thing, let's say in this idealized future, you would maybe look at these other times through your own eyes and just pull out the bits. Maybe you like the fashion or the, the way language was used. You'd play on those things rather than being interested in the historical reality. Well, it's a little bit like that show we were watching on Apple TV last year, After Party, yeah. where one of the characters was having a flashback to something that had happened, but she was seeing it like through the eyes of oh, Jane yes. Austen. <laughs> Now it makes sense because she was actually sort of interweaving it into her <laughs> reality and it didn't have anything yeah. to do with what it was really like. Right. That I could sort of get on board with. I think you're right that you would tend towards making it this overly romanticized view yeah. of the sort of the fantasy of what you would like it to be like. I mean, none of that's ever made any sense to me. And it's partially because of the stuff we've talked about, but it's mostly because of the treatment of women. <laughs> There's nothing for me in that time yeah. period. So yeah. I just, I don't know. I don't get it. Anyway, we've talked about it more than the scene went on. <laughs> I think we've gone on longer than the scene, actually. Yeah. Now we go to sick bay, and we've got Tuvok and Chakotay now both apparently unconscious. The doctor says they've both taken a blast to the head by some kind of... <laughs> It's our first some kind of today. Some kind of energy discharge. And Tuvok has a concussion. No biggie. But Chakotay has had all of his bioneural energy extracted from his brain. The doctor says he's brain dead. <laughs> and I intend to use Chakotay being brain dead at some point in the future on this podcast. <laughs> you reserve the right to pull that up again. <laughs> Don't you think somebody should have asked, does he still have his lungs? <laughs> oh, my God. That's right. We lost some lungs and now we've lost a brain. <laughs> And we cue the theme song. Now, that's a proper opening. I agree. I agree. We didn't have it last week, but we had it this week. Now, Tuvok is awake, and he describes an attack on the shuttle, saying they had completed their trade mission with the Illidarians yep. when they encountered a dark matter nebula. That's a new one. Haven't heard that one. A ship emerged and attacked them. The energy discharge penetrated the shields and filled the cabin. Tuvok was able to activate the autopilot before losing consciousness. And the story is already a little bit suspicious. I mean, what happened to the other ship when he went into autopilot mode? Nothing? Yeah, that had already attacked them. Exactly. It's like they took one shot and then they went back in the nebula. Hmm. Yeah, we're done. Tuvok doesn't have any info about the discharge, but suggests that the shuttle sensors may have some useful info. And he says he'll download the logs. The doctor says Chakotay's only hope for survival is if we can learn exactly how his neurons were depleted. Yeah. And he wants a look at the weapon. So Janeway immediately says, we're going back to that nebula. Because we've learned nothing <laughs> about how nebulas are dangerous in the first 13 episodes of this show. Now, you made a comment about, don't you think Janeway can be a little reckless at times? It was a good example, yeah. I also found it strange that Tuvok would be the one to go to the shuttle and download the logs. Yeah. He had a concussion, right? He was just injured. Why wouldn't she say, oh, no, we'll send, you know, Balana or somebody else out there or this other lieutenant who appears out of nowhere later? Yeah. No, she's just like, yeah, OK, you go check it out. But do you think that could be because maybe they are slightly short staffed? Yeah. We don't know if Voyager has a full crew complement. So maybe there's a lot of people having to cross responsibilities. So it's not that unrealistic. That Tuvok would do that? Well, surely there's enough people to send someone down to get some logs while yeah. this guy with a concussion recovers. That's a good point. I mean, what's Harry doing? He's not doing anything. He hasn't been kidnapped. <laughs> He's got a lot of time on his hands. <laughs> Maybe there's now a rule. Don't send Harry down because there'll probably be some residual energy from the weapon and Harry will end up in sickbay again. Well, that's exactly why they would send Harry. Oh, he's like the... um. He's the punching bag. He's the lightning rod for any kind of trouble. <laughs> right. Now on the bridge, Tuvok reports that the energy discharge overloaded the shuttlecraft's computer core and the sensor data has been erased. Janeway says to tell Belana to try and reconstruct any of the data from the shuttle. Meanwhile, the captain has been analyzing the nebula and it's sending out strong electromagnetic radiation so we can't scan what's inside of it. She says it seems like quite a good hiding place. 
So by all means, let's just get right over there. <laughs> Remember the last nebula you went into? <sighs> let's just think about that for a minute. Yeah. And then she loses sensor contact with the nebula just as Voyager changes course. She looks at Tom, but Tom has no idea what happened. Harry claims the course was entered from the con, but Tom is like, I didn't do it. In sickbay now, Belana is performing a healing ritual that Chakotay taught her, something specific to his tribe. There's a medicine wheel above Chicote, and Belana is placing some stones on the wheel, essentially pointing the way back to Chicote, who has lost his way because he's in a coma. Belana is surprised to learn that the doctor knows all about this wheel, and the doctor says this isn't going to work because there's not enough of his mind left to work with. Now, I don't have any idea of the legitimacy of this story, but Belana is trying to be a good friend, and I think, you know, that's good. I like that. Well, there's a really heartfelt piece where she says to him before she leaves, find your way home, Commander. And I thought that was a nice touch, showing that bond that these two clearly have. It seemed very genuine. Yeah, I agree. And if you want more information, you can always read up on medicine wheels within Native American indigenous cultures. It is a real thing. Now we go to Kessa's quarters, and she has the feeling someone is there with her, and we get some eerie music, and we see <laughs> from someone else's point of view that yeah. she's right, but we don't see or hear anyone. Now, are we going to bring up why she has a statue of the Grand Vegas in her quarters? What? I didn't see it. She has like this bust in her quarters. Yeah. And it has like big earlobes. And the first thing I thought was, why does she have the Grand Nagus in there? Oh, okay. I'll have to go back and watch. <laughs> no reason. It looks enough like the Grand Nagus for me to go, huh? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> it looked enough like the Grand Nagus. Well, she goes to see her useless boyfriend, Neelix, and tell him <laughs> that she sensed some kind of presence in her quarters. And Neelix is as unhelpful as usual. Yeah. Back to the bridge, and the course has changed again, and now the helm is not responding. Harry says he's locked out. Tuvok says the lockout originated on Deck 12 in navigational control. So Janeway calls Belana, who says she just saw Tom in there a few minutes ago. But Tom is like, uh, no way, I didn't do that. He asks if he's being accused of something, and Tuvok does say he was awfully close to both locations where the course change was entered. Yeah. And then Janeway in this sort of weird kind of laughing way, says she's willing to rule out mutiny for the time being. It was that was a strange line delivery. I would have thought she would take that more seriously. Me too. Me too. It's like one of your crew appears to be doing something against orders. And it's like, it happens. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to just completely trust blindly. I mean, I get it. He yeah. says he didn't do it, but you should be investigating. Right. And she has Tom do the analysis of his console. You yeah. should have somebody else do it. You know who would say that they didn't do it? The bad guy. Somebody who was guilty of doing it. Yeah. Well, she tells Tom that she believes him, but he might be having a problem with his memory and he should go have the doctor check him out. I think it would have been better with just that line and yeah. not the line before. Right, right. So off he goes to sickbay. And the doctor is scanning Tom with his usual attitude, <laughs> and there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with him. Yeah. But Tuvok enters, and unfortunately for Tom, traces of his DNA were found on the Navigational Control Council. Whoops. The doctor says maybe a biomolecular scan will reveal something, and everyone looks concerned. This scene was funny for the simple reason that it came out so well how the doctor is just irritated by Tom. <laughs> yeah. Like how Tom is reminiscing about his doctor back home on Earth called Doc like Brown. Like his childhood doctor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doc Brown, obviously from Back to the Future. Right. <laughs> That's what I thought too. And when Tuvok comes in and asks how Tom is doing, the way the doctor says, he's fine other than his irritating lapses into nostalgia. Yeah. It's funny how the Hollow program just doesn't like Tom. It's kind no. of priceless. It's like that's what somebody programmed into it. It's such a contrast between how he behaves towards Cass. But it doesn't make any sense why he doesn't like Tom, because Tom is not the one who's rude to him. There are other characters who are much ruder than yeah. Tom is. And Tom is even the one who suggested the doctor for the Beowulf mission. Yeah. So I'm not sure I understand what his problem is with Tom. Maybe the original senior medical officer who died, maybe he put something in his log about Tom. <laughs> you know, he didn't like Tom. Oh, so it could be. Maybe the doctor read that yeah. Yeah, and went, oh, yeah, we don't like him. <laughs> Good headcanon, Kim. Thank you. Back to the bridge, and this character I don't think we've ever seen before, and now has a name, walks by the camera for like the third time in this episode. Yep. This is Lieutenant Durst. I don't think we ever see him again oh. after this. <laughs> after this episode, I mean. We see him in this episode many times, but suddenly he has lines. He's all over the place here. 
I started to wonder if he was a distraction. Yeah. You know, like we were supposed to think, oh, there's the bad guy, right. this new person who's just appeared. Yeah, it did give you that impression. I agree. But then they should have used him a little differently because he was yeah. really no threat. That's a good point. You could have written to make you think that there was something about him as a complete yeah. red herring. Or have him get taken yeah. over at least once. Before we leave this guy, we do have to point out that he appears in Deep Space Nine as the awesome Dr. Elias Geiger in the episode In mm -hmm. the Cards, where we get the great line, cellular ennui. <laughs> oh, the cellular ennui. That's right. Yeah, I'd forgotten about him in Deep Space Nine until you pointed that out last night, but that's pretty funny. That's a great episode. I'd advise people to see it. Also, another fun fact by this guy, Kim, he appears as mm -hmm. a different character in Voyager. Does he? Yes. Okay, well, I look forward to that. Well, Tuvok has found the ion trail of the ship that attacked the shuttle. It leads directly into the Dark Matter Nebula. Just as Janeway is about to order they follow the path, the ship drops to impulse power and the warp core is shutting down. Janeway calls Belana, who does not respond, so they run to engineering, where they find Belana and ask her why she's issued an emergency warp core shutdown. And Belana is like, I'm sorry, what? Oh, uh, what? And Tuvok <laughs> just like tosses her out of the way as Janeway checks and says, it's too late. Now it's going to take two hours to reset the dilithium matrix. She tells Belana she crashed the main computer, locked out the bridge, and stopped the ship cold. Belana has no idea what she's talking about, which makes Janeway <laughs> say what the rest of us are thinking. What the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I like the way they actually run in this show. I know. I love that they run. And the way Janeway just grabs the railing and like swings into the, by the warp core to actually examine it. She is like right there in the action. Yep. I love it. Now we go to sick bay where it's quite dark and the doctor says, I found something and you're not going to like it. I mean, he's such a human, not a computer program. <laughs> now we get some techno babble, which shows a different memory pattern in Tom's scan at the exact moment that Tom had his memory blackouts. And it turns out the exact same pattern is also in Belana's scan. This made me really curious. Do our brains actually store historical patterns with timestamps? Because this reading is very specific. <laughs> Clearly. Absolutely. <laughs> I thought that was funny. It does make you wonder, how are they scanning their brains for particular timestamps? Yeah, the past. Are they doing it all the time? I... Do they, they have invasive technology that knows what you're thinking? I mean, it might make sense if that was always happening. Yeah. Because then you could use machine learning to identify when there were problems about to happen. It would actually be quite smart. But yeah. I don't think they were thinking about that at this point. Oh. They could do something like that, though, on a current show. That would be a little bit invasive, though. It's scanning your brain and yeah, but when scanning you're... your brain patterns. But remember, when you're in Starfleet, you get taken over by aliens all the time. It's a high-risk oh. thing. And this would just yeah. be to prevent that. Oh, yeah. Maybe once a shift, you have to go to the scanner and go, <laughs> taken over by aliens, green light, red light. No, you're fine. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the Silkwood shower scene. Oh, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <sighs> that scene still gives me nightmares. That's harsh. That's harsh, yeah. Well, at any rate, some other brainwave <laughs> is imposing itself into their brains, uh, hence the episode title. And it seems like we have an intruder. Tuvok suggests the intruder may have returned on the shuttlecraft with them. And Janeway says, well, this alien can jump from person to person, and it seems intent on us not going back to the nebula. And of course, like in Beowulf, the doctor is now the only one who can do something because yeah. he's the one without brainwaves. Right, that it can't impact. So we get some intense music as Janeway transfers her command codes to the doctor as a failsafe so he can countermand any seemingly crazy order. Yeah. But to me, the problem with this theory is if he's a program in the computer, if somebody takes over the ship or the main computer, then don't they have access right. to him? Yeah. And this is the floor, I think, which happens a little bit later on, of the computer system, oh, right. the, yeah. the holodeck program, is vulnerable. Therefore, you need to isolate the holodeck program until you're sure that you're safe. Yeah. I don't know if I noticed at the time, but we're pretty loosey-goosey here with the doctor and his functions on the show. Yeah. It's very clear now. Probably because well, there have been so many Star Treks <laughs> since then that we've seen. <laughs> I kind of like it that they're expanding this character. We're seeing him become much more competent as an officer because they're giving him the responsibilities. Right. I mean, it must be a pretty good program if it can adapt to the going on an away mission, now receiving the command codes, the way it definitely is developing a personality. Yeah, yeah, true. Maybe part of this is simply that Robert Picardo brought the character to life. 
Yeah, maybe. Maybe it was written a great deal more stiffly, but he managed to basically give it this great persona yeah. from the beginning. I don't know. He's probably talked about that in an interview. I can't say I've seen a lot of interviews with him. Yeah. Maybe we can call him. <laughs> Tweet him. Now we're off to repair the warp core when Kess comes running up saying she's been sensing the alien presence all day. And just then this presence flies by them in the hallway without anybody knowing. Yeah. And Tuvok suggests that he do a mind meld on her to try and help her focus her telepathic abilities. So off they go to do that. Considering how much the doctor says mind melds are dangerous. It... He'd throw it out there pretty quickly. Without consulting the doctor either. Well, that might be why. Later, Harry and this never-before-seen lieutenant are walking and talking. Durst. But the point of the scene is they walk into a turbo lift and they find Kess and Tuvok on the floor unconscious. Yep. And we see some, like, bruises on Kess's throat. Yeah. Tuvok and Kess were hit by some kind of, another one, <laughs> energy discharge. And once again, Tuvok was not badly hurt while Kess is in a coma. Okay, you got to be questioning. Yes. Why Tuvok keeps on coming out of these scraps. Just fine, thank you. Mm-hmm. Tuvok is describing the discharge, but Belana says the ship's sensors never picked that up. Tom suggests a magneton scan to try and root out the alien being, and Belana says, let's do a magneton flash scan on the entire ship, which might reveal the anomalous energy. Yeah. Then they notice Harry is staring blankly into the distance, and everyone panics. Tuvok points a phaser at him. Belana starts scanning him. <laughs> but Harry says he was just thinking about an old study he saw about magneton scanners, and his mind wandered. Janeway doesn't like how we jump to paranoia so quickly. <laughs> she tells Belana and Tuvok to get to work on the scanner. Yeah. And again, I was like, what? Why Tuvok? This would be a job for Belana and Harry. I don't get why Tuvok's involved. I have an overanalysis point. Okay. I would question Starfleet procedure here. Tuvok has been in contact with a belligerent alien that shot at the ship, injured Chakotay, rendered him with a concussion. And you're letting him back on regular duty. Yeah. You would think that the standard procedure would be to either isolate him because you don't know what other damage could have been caused or have him on light duties or supervised duties or something. Because how can you be sure that he hasn't been impacted by this attack? Maybe in ways you haven't found out yet. Yeah. It seems like a dangerous procedure to just go, hey, he's fine. Really, that's a Star Trek flaw. That's not a Star Trek Voyager flaw. Yeah. We don't really pay much attention to stuff like that. Like, we should. Yeah. You should definitely be quarantined, yeah. put under observation, something. But yeah, we don't right. We do not do anything. Now, this is where I could say the thing that you brought up earlier, you know, maybe they're short-staffed and so they can't afford to do things right. like that. That's right. possible. Except this is definitely what Star Trek would do. And any of the shows <laughs> would do the same thing. Right. Well, and the movies as well. well yeah. Remember in Generations, Geordie's been captured and tortured by the Klingons and what's his name? And they're like, hey, he checks out. We got him back. <laughs> We're sure he's fine. We'll let him back in engineering. He'll be fine. Yeah. It is a consistent flaw, yes. But even beyond that, it doesn't make sense to me. This wouldn't be the head of security's job to do what she asked Belana to do. It would make so much more sense if it were Harry. Yeah. In sickbay now, Neelix is paranoid that everyone but him is possessed <laughs> by the alien. That was funny when he starts asking the doctor to start dissecting people. Yes. The good news is the doctor doesn't think Kess has suffered any permanent damage, and Neelix hugs him, which I thought was quite <laughs> cute, and he leaves just as Tuvok enters and starts messing with a panel on the wall. Oh, the look on the doctor's face when Neelix hugged him. Yeah, that was funny. Tuvok says he's reconfiguring the sensor relays on the ship, Captain's orders, and then he asks about Kess, and at this moment... In watching the episode for the first time, I thought Tuvok yeah. was going to do something bad and reveal himself as the bad guy, but that's not what happens. No. The doctor tells Tuvok that Kess's injuries appear to be from a physical struggle, not like what happened to Chakotay. So now we go to the captain's office and Tuvok says the flash scan will be ready in two hours. He says it will be a high-intensity burst causing dizziness and disorientation in all crew members. And then he tells Janeway that there is evidence that Kess was physically assaulted, which finally, finally brings out yeah. some paranoia in Chainway. <laughs> she wonders if Tuvok might have been inhabited by the alien and then assaulted Kess. Yeah. So he suggests that he gets a scan from the doctor as well. So Janeway calls the doctor, but Major Roddenberry says, oh, the EMH has been disabled. Uh-oh. Right. That was kind of an obvious pointer there. Yeah. Tuvok had just been in for the doctor and mm -hmm. then 
the doctors offline. It seems not only has the doctor been deactivated, but the program is now encrypted and can't be reactivated easily. Nice. This means the command codes have reverted back to Janeway. So she suggests splitting her command protocols into two code groupings, with Tuvok holding one and her the other, since the alien can't likely invade both of them at the same time. Yeah. They quickly hit the bridge so she can inform everyone of this, but before she can get the whole story out, she seems to get possessed by the alien, and she does a classic Star Trek double fist upward punch. (laughs) Love it. Knocking Tuvok to the floor and kicking the phaser out of his hand. Yep. Tuvok shouts, stun her. She's the alien, and Tom shoots Janeway, knocking her down, but then the alien takes over Harry, and Tom punches him in the face, (laughs) and then it's Lieutenant, what's his name? (laughs) Durst. He fires a phaser, and Tuvok jumps up and somehow with his phaser stuns everyone with a single shot. Yeah, that was pretty cool that he managed to shoot everybody on the bridge simultaneously. Yes, and how was he just instantly prepared to do that? Yeah, you know, I think that's the first time we've seen a phaser like that. Mm. Wouldn't that have been useful on the siege of AR-558? It would have been useful in many ways, yes. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, oh, uh, we have this technology when we need it. It would have been better if doing that one time like blew the phaser out or something. Oh, right. Yeah, except he... Yeah, yeah. like it blew up and he had to drop it. That would have been a good one. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that would be good because then you wouldn't be able to keep on using it. Yeah. It would be like a one-time thing. Yeah. Also, this is the point where Harry gets punched in the face. (laughs) Yes. He can't go an episode unscathed. True. In sickbay, we're all recovering, and Harry is working on getting the doctor back online, but it's going to take a few hours. Belana calls the captain to engineering. She's discovered that the sensor logs on the shuttle weren't destroyed by an energy discharge, but they were erased by someone. And worse, Tuvok's story is fishy because there is no evidence of a ship having attacked. The discharge came from the nebula itself. Yes. Janeway wonders why Tuvok would lie, and Belana suggests the alien may have taken him over. Now, this is the point of why don't you call for an emergency transport and put Tuvok under supervision? Yeah, or put him in the brig. Yeah. Immediately. Right. But no, we leave him on the bridge. Oh, dear. <laughs> Jane right now hears that they're near the Dark Matter Nebula, and yeah. Belana says there's about 15 minutes until the magneton scan is ready. Janeway tells Belana to transfer control of the scan to the bridge, and she puts her hand on Belana's shoulder and she says, it's time to take a look at what it is we're not supposed to see. And then she runs off. I don't know, I just like that scene. Yeah. Back on the bridge, Janeway asks Tuvok to identify the ion trail of the ship that attacked him. So now we're on this new course following that trail. Yep. Tom turns up to say he finished the bioanalysis the doctor was running on Kess before he was deactivated, and it seems that Kess's injuries were the result of a Vulcan neck pinch. Emergency transport, Tuvok to the brig. Or everybody get your phasers out, what are you doing? Everyone looks at Tuvok, who says he doesn't remember doing that. Maybe the alien had taken over his actions. Yeah. Janeway, becoming more paranoid, says the alien assaulted Tuvok in three separate instances. <laughs> Tuvok tells her she's being paranoid, and she says, maybe, but she wants to see for herself how he's picking up this ion trail. So she looks at it herself and says, this appears to be a ship without engines. You're lying. There's no alien ship, and there never was. She says, we're not going into that nebula without some answers. And she tells Harry to reverse course. But Tuvok pulls his phaser and says, the alien has been trying to prevent us from entering the nebula. So the alien must now be in the captain. I mean, that's not illogical. (laughs) But (laughs) he says he's relieving her of command and tells Harry to proceed into the nebula. But Janeway says, don't do it, Harry. Fortunately, Harry picks the right side and refuses. (laughs) So Tuvok says he's taking command of the bridge and he makes everyone stand in a group. Tuvok's also put the phaser on kill as well. Yes, and it's still on that broadband setting or whatever he called it, which absolutely should make it overheat. Yeah, even bigger question of why they didn't use that on AR-558. And the creepy new guy now Durst. whispers in Janeway's ear, we're entering the nebula. He got a line, that's great. I mean, actually, or is it his second line? That's like his third line, I think. He oh, has wow. many lines in this episode and he's still got more to come. But this lieutenant guy Durst. whispering in Janeway's ear is the creepiest thing that happens in this creepy episode. (laughs) I I wouldn't have been surprised if she turned her head and said, who the hell are you? (laughs) This guy's the alien. I've never seen him before. Now he's on the bridge. Well, Tuvok is just working away on the console while Harry looks at some readings on a screen and he quietly tells the captain that he sees some highly coherent energy pulses coming out of the nebula And Janeway says, life forms. They have a biomatrix. Yes, and Harry says they're heading this way. 
So Janeway asks Tuvok who he is, and he says, we are the Komar, and this is our domain. Yes. Down in engineering, the alien presence continues to fly around looking for someone to take over. He lands on Belana, and she suddenly leaves her station and goes to a different console, pushing some buttons, and the <laughs> ship jolts. It's great the way she just stands straight upright and then marches to the console. Yes. And Ensign Creepy now says, the warp core has been ejected. This irritates Tuvok, who says, no, we must continue. Belana calls to say she thinks she was taken over by the alien. I love that everybody is self-reporting now. <laughs> this really cracks me up from here. I think I was taken over by the alien. <laughs> and then Tom and Harry start whispering, and they conclude, maybe there are two aliens. Yeah, guys, come on. <laughs> Finally, Janeway realizes Lieutenant Torres isn't authorized to eject the warp core on her own, and she asks the computer who entered the order, and Major Roddenberry says... Commander Chicote, and yes. suddenly it's all making sense. All the pieces click into place. And again, we're just all standing here not doing anything. Tuvok's not even looking. He's looking down at the console. Somebody shoot him. They all still have their phasers. Yeah. Somebody at the back of the crowd get the phaser out. Or couldn't Belana, somebody not on the bridge, you know, do the thing oh. where they send the poisonous gas in or the sleeping gas or whatever? Computer, flood the bridge with neurocene gas. Yes. No, we don't do that. I guess we're worried he's going to press the button and kill everybody. Okay, here's what you do. You get Durst to stand in front. <laughs> yes. Creepy guy, stand here. Just stand here. Then flood the bridge with neurocene gas. It was always popular for knocking out the Jem'Hadar. That's true. Janeway realizes the Tuvok alien wants us in the nebula, but the other alien is trying to keep us out. So if it's Chicote, he knows we'll be in danger if we go in there. Yeah. Tuvok has now engaged emergency thrusters and we're on the move again. Right. So Janeway asks if he's brought them there to extract everyone's neural energy. Very perceptive, Alien <laughs> Tuvok says. The collective neural energy of your crew will sustain our people for years to come. And then Harry says we're being bombarded by the energy beings as the ship shakes. And now Janeway drops down and presses a button on the captain's console, which I believe sets off the magneton flash pulse that we were waiting for. Yep. And everyone gets a bit disoriented. Tuvok in particular is rocked back and Tom grabs his phaser. Tuvok goes down. Yeah, he just collapses. Yeah. And the alien's energy exits him and disappears into the wall. And we learn the flash scan identified a trionic based energy being, which I guess was alien Tuvok. Yep. Which just escapes through the wall. Yeah. So that being somehow leaves the ship to join his friends. But I don't know if you noticed this, but that makes no sense because the shields are up. Yeah. So and, if they can't get in, how could it get out? Yes, that is a, f a slight flaw here in this story. <laughs> but oh well. Tom says now he can't find his way out of the nebula. Lieutenant Creepy Guy now says that shields are dropping and the beings are starting to penetrate the defenses. Yep. Which in my notes I wrote, Tuvox Alien already did that. But anyway. <laughs> Oh, only getting out. They can't get back in. Yeah, they. it's like... Uh, it's like a one-way trapdoor. Yeah, it's a one-way thing, exactly. It's like those spikes on the road, right, that you can drive over, but you can't <laughs> <laughs> reverse. Reverse over. Now we see the other alien that's flying around the ship, and it's flying around in sickbay, and it enters Neelix. And Neelix walks over to the medicine wheel and moves some of the stones around. On the bridge, Neelix calls to say the alien just took him over and made him do something strange with the stones. Like you said, everybody's now self-reporting. We're all self-reporting. Although I, too, at this moment was thinking, would Janeway really answer a call from Neelix right now? <laughs> she would be like, what? I'm busy. Will he probably be calling to tell her that lunch will be ready in 15? <laughs> yes. Has anybody seen the cinnamon route? I, I thought I had some. Oh, my God. He's very good at calling at inappropriate times. So everybody looks at the medicine wheel on the view screen, and somehow the rocks have been moved into a copy of the star map showing the planetoids that they were talking about earlier. Yeah. And now we have a way out, apparently, by following this map, which... I just don't see how you overlay a three-dimensional star map over a two-dimensional piece of cloth, but okay, okay. Well, Harry figured it out. He did. Well, anyway, we use this to navigate our way out. Lots of bouncing around and lights flashing, but we clear the nebula and everything is fine and the aliens are not pursuing. It's quite a good shot of Voyager here because you see like the shields are currently up and they're, whatever it is is attacking them. So parts of the shield oh, are yeah. glowing. It was a nice effect. And then they come out of the nebula and it looks like there's sort of mist or smoke. Yes. And Harry seems quite relieved. And for once, he made it through yeah. an entire episode without being kidnapped. And only one punch in the face. <laughs> he did get punched in the face and taken over by an alien. 
Well, not an alien, Chicote. So oh, it's Chicote, fine. Chicote, yeah. Yeah. It was a friendly takeover. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. So they pick up the warp core that Belana dropped earlier, and now we're trying to reintegrate Chicote's consciousness. They're just lucky with that warp core that there weren't any Ferengi hanging around. No, yeah, it's just sitting there. I guess they they didn't leave it there for that long. You know, it's probably if these nebula Aliens beings are like that. There probably isn't many ships nearby if they attack them and suck <laughs> yeah. the brains out of their crew. There needs to be some kind of a warning beacon here. Oh, yeah. Put a war. Yeah, that would be responsible. Yeah, hopefully Voyager leaves one. When we were talking about having to reintegrate Chakotay's consciousness, I-, I was thinking, let's just leave him out. I like him better this way. <laughs> and then let's see if we can do the same thing to Neelix. <laughs> They're much better like this. I believe one of the comments we've already received about Neelix is, I would have put him out of an airlock already. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've had a few emails too about Neelix. Not popular. Now everyone is hovering over Chakotay, who wakes up just fine. We get some techno babble about how the doctor got his brainwaves back in his head. I don't know. (laughs) Well, he wants to publish a paper about it. And he says, if there was only a convenient forum. Yeah, but you could still write the paper. I didn't understand what he was complaining about there. Like, create a forum. I don't get it. I think we're seeing that He wants recognition for what he's doing. Well, write the paper. Voyager is going to eventually get back, even if you're the only one left and you'll get recognition. He shouldn't have any real concerns about time. You know, if you're a hologram, yeah, what is 70 years? Yeah, write the paper. What is 100 years? He's a bit whiny here. (laughs) Janeway asks Chakotay what happened. He said he felt himself floating above his own body and he thought he was dead. And somehow he eventually figured out how to take over people. So he became a poltergeist. Yeah, he apologizes to Tuvok for knocking him around. And Janeway says, welcome back. And he says he feels like he never left. And everything is completely back to normal. Oh. No biggie. <laughs> the end. <laughs> oh, classic. Oh, so classic Star Trek. Yep. All right. Do you have over analysis? Yes, I have a few over analysis points. First one. Now. Lieutenant Durst, or creepy guy as you keep on calling him, yeah. reported that the aliens were penetrating the hull right before they got out. So could other members of the crew be possessed by them? And wouldn't that be a concern after what happened to Tuvok? Well, I thought about that, but I wonder if that magneton flash thing may yeah. have scared them off. Oh. Like maybe it was super painful and maybe it actually injured that alien. Yeah, that one. So once they were out of the nebula, they didn't want to try hanging around on the ship because they could get they killed. They had a by quick it. conference. Yeah. And the Tuvok thing said, you know, that sucks. Don't get that. Dang, that hurt. Or maybe he died. Who knows? Uh, oh, interesting point. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that would. So, I'm going to yeah. headcanon my way out of that one. <laughs> okay. That's good headcanon. I will accept that one that it was dangerous for them. So they decided not to pursue once they were out of the nebula. Okay. I'll go with that. Next thing. So. When Kess described something was off, that there was an alien presence that she could sense, yeah, because she said she could sense something unusual all day, was that the alien or was she talking about the floating Chakotay? I took it as she was sensing the alien. Oh, that's a good point. I assumed it was Chakotay because it was Chakotay who was in her room. Yeah. But... Maybe the alien Tuvok thought that's what she meant, was that oh, she yeah. you know, was on to him. Right. They're a bit oh. loosey-goosey exa- with what yeah. exactly was going on with Tuvok, because was he always completely controlled by that alien, or was he sometimes Tuvok? That's uh, okay. a little hard to follow. That actually leads on to my next question, which is, was Tuvok under control all time, or was he having these blackout moments where it was taking over? I think it was just taking over at very specific points, like Mm -hmm. when they went in the elevator, turbo lift, sorry, and did the neck pinch. Because when he went and told Janeway about how Mm -hmm. the the doctor said she'd been assaulted and there was injuries on her neck. Yeah, he didn't have to tell her. He didn't have to do that. Because he'd already disabled the doctor. Right. So I think he was just, the alien was just popping in and out of control enough so that Tuvok wasn't aware of it. And I'll justify that with Tuvok remained very true to his own character. And would this alien be able to pass off being Tuvok all the time? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I have a question about why he didn't sabotage the magneton flash scan thing, you know, that was going to root him out. And I guess because... It wasn't the alien, it was really Tuvok. So that makes sense. Oh, and I'll add to that. Maybe the alien was unaware that the magnetron scan would do anything. 
Yeah, maybe. It didn't know or understand the technology behind it. Okay. So I think the conclusion is Tuvok was himself, but the alien was just popping in and out when it needed to. Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah. They could have been clearer about that, though. Right. So Chakotay said about how, at the beginning, all he could do was, when he took over a body, was doing simple things like pushing buttons or working a console. Couldn't he get to a keyboard and push the buttons saying, help, it's me, Chakotay, Tuvok is possessed. <laughs> Text. <sighs> yes, I was wondering that too. Like, right. you can't send a message, send a private message to the captain. Yeah. Like he controlled Tom enough when he, you know, modified the navigation system and turned it off. Yeah. When he was there, couldn't he message Janeway somehow? Yeah. There was enough time. Maybe he didn't have all the logic that he would normally have. He seemed oh. pretty focused on one thing, which was just stopping them from getting to the nebula. Yeah. And that's sort of the last thing that happened to him before he was separated from his body. So yeah. maybe that's all he could think about, right? Was got to stop the ship. Right. So he wasn't fully in control of his faculties. <laughs> yeah. He was somewhat uh, scattered. Literally. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a good one. I think my next point, we've already talked about this, Starfleet needs a proper process for when you come in contact with mm. belligerent aliens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need a quarantine protocol. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then we need to follow it. <laughs> it's like that scene in Alien. Yes. The original, where if everybody had followed the rules and listened to Ripley, none of that would have happened. There's a reason she's the only one who survives. Yeah. It wouldn't have been so good for John Hurt, but mm -hmm. everyone else would have been okay. He would have just died out on the planet. Mm -hmm. And my final point, which is... Probably more of a headcanon stroke critique for this episode. I wish they'd used Kess's psychic powers to put Chakotay's consciousness back in his body. Mm. She's right there. They have this character they were building to that. This would be perfect yeah. to use her for that. Otherwise, I feel it was far too hand wavy. Last three minutes, everybody's fine. Yeah, we didn't have time to really do anything. It, yeah. We could have gotten rid of the stupid six minute thing at the beginning. And done that. Let me cut that down. Yeah. Oh. Or at least had her involved. Yes. Do something to maybe she could have corralled Chakotay or something. Right. Got him yeah. into the sick bay or whatever. That would have been good. Yeah. Yeah. Or even uh, something like finding there's a half Beta Z on board, like Diana, that you could use for this. I felt that they went a little bit too far into hand wavy territory of, mm. oh, the doctor just used a computer and put his consciousness back in. Yeah. Very TNG. Yeah. I'm okay with it. <laughs> I am. I mean, it's a Star Trek hand wave. I don't think it's out of order. No, but I demand more. I'm a demanding viewer. Sure. Unless it involves Captain Sisko. <laughs> then a little bit less so. He has the power of the prophets. You can excuse that. Oh, God. He's one step away from a cue. At the end, maybe, yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> if you haven't watched that 30-year-old show. To quote one of my friends when he was talking about the Maltese Falcon, and I said, wait, no spoilers. He said, look, you've had almost a hundred years to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And that wraps up my overanalysis. Over to you, Kim. Well, we've already covered my first two points because my first one was about Tuvok and was he always under the control of the alien? Yeah. Because it didn't make sense to me that he didn't sabotage the magneton thing. Right. But we talked about that. And then we also talked about the other hole where the aliens could get out, but not into the shields. We already covered that. The last thing in my over analysis is, are these aliens zombies because they're here to eat your brains? <laughs> We've had space vampires. And now we have zombies. And these are really scary ones because they don't actually even have bodies. Yeah. They just take over your body and then suck your brain. They seem pretty nasty. Yeah, they do. I really hope Voyager does put up like a distress buoy saying, stay away. Yeah, really. Space zombies ahead. Yeah, put up a little sign. Right. Well, now I'll go to women in the future and... I didn't write down any notes because there wasn't a lot. <laughs> there wasn't a lot yeah. to say about it. I guess Neelix not really believing Kess is pretty much on brand, so really nothing else to say about that. Worst boyfriend ever. And then there's the Janeway hollow novel. I don't know. I've met women who think the past is where they want to be. <laughs> Frankly, I'll just never <laughs> understand it. So whatever. Let I'll just let it go. Yeah. Who was that? Remember that writer we saw, we saw? Yeah. at WonderCon? Yeah, she was really into, what period was it? Victoriana. Oh, and we kept looking at each other like, there were no toilets. What are you talking about? 
But she seemed quite happy to look back on it very positively. Right. Okay. So anyway, that I guess to each their own. And there's no leadership notes today in the Janeway Leadership Corner. Um, yeah. Total shocker. I did feel like we were all doing the best that we could. <laughs> I mean, we talked a few times about how, why didn't we beam Tuvok right to the brig? Or why didn't we shoot somebody in this moment or whatever? But yeah. that's just Star Trek. I, there was nothing specific about any leadership. You could argue that maybe the protocols are lacking. Yeah. I mean, realistically, we should be adjusting our protocols to be the only ship in this quadrant, right. you know, coming up with some new rules. But that's a that's a bit of a stretch for an episodic <laughs> show. And they've got a lot they're dealing with. This is probably yeah. low down on the priority. I would think so. You know, based on what you just said there, I think if you maybe made this show today, I think you'd have a bigger emphasis on making it much more of a struggle for the crew about them running out of energy about dilithium running low, about food being a problem. You'd make it a little grittier. You know what I mean? Uh, well, I'm not sure you would if you were making a Star Trek show. Yeah. They haven't really done that on Discovery. Discovery's got a darker, kind of grittier edge. Yeah. But we're not forced to watch them starve. <laughs> and, I mean, we've talked about this before. I just don't think that's Trek. Yeah. You, you, ha you can't take the hope out of Trek. Because then you got something else. It's not that that's not a good show, but it's not Star Trek. No, I, I don't think I would take the hope out of it. I would just make it a little bit more of a human struggle. You'd play up that coming together and the positive elements of Trek, but I think I'd make it a little bit more difficult for them. Yeah, maybe a little more difficult would be acceptable. And I, I think yeah. even in the 90s, I think you would have made it more difficult, except it was episodic. Oh, and yeah. they were so focused on the money of episodic right, right. television and syndication yeah, that's true. that they forced that out of the equation. So you can criticize Voyager all you want <laughs> that, you know, oh my God, they should have been paying more attention to that. That's not what they wanted. Yeah. They wanted an episodic show that was going to make money in syndication and that's what they got. And I don't see that as a criticism of the show. I just no. see it as if you were doing it today, you're in a different environment. Yeah. This show serialized would be very different. Yeah. It'd be fun if somebody made it now. I would watch it. Well, it's Trek. I feel like I'm duty bound to watch it. Well, we say that, but we don't want to watch Enterprise. <laughs> I got another couple of emails about Enterprise. I tried. I really tried. Uh, we might go back to it if we really need something to criticize. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> let's see what happens when we get through the things we like. Yeah. Okay, let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? Oh, absolute two thumbs up. Great episode. That sort of feeling of paranoia or something just yeah. slightly wrong, out of balance mm -hmm. through the whole episode, great. And the way it was resolved in the end, great. Truly a good Star Trek episode. Great performance by the Doctor, who wasn't the focus of the episode, but had some very good scenes. I can nitpick individual things, but it's an episode you can go back and watch again. Thumbs up. Enjoyable episode. You know, now that you mentioned performances, it would have been interesting if they had done something a little bit different with Tuvok to sort of see the change in him. Yeah. You know, but they didn't do that at all. He pretty much remained Tuvok the entire time. Even when the alien really came out and he said who he was, he was still exactly like Tuvok. Right. They could have added a little nuance there. But regardless, the rock map was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, this is a classic Star Trek episode. Yeah. Self-contained, the double-handed fist punch, a nebula. <laughs> Nasty aliens. Some paranoia about who is the good guy and who is the bad guy. And everyone is 100% fine and back to normal at the end. And we never mention it again. Absolutely loved it. <laughs> Total thumbs up. <laughs> Agreed. This episode is kind of a low rating on IMDb. It's just really? nonsense. This is a great oh. episode. Uh, the IMDb ratings are, they're crazy. Yeah. Oh, they're all over the place. Yeah. This is a solid Trek episode. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I really liked it. All right. That wraps up lucky number 13. Come back next week for episode 14. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com, or you can hit us up on the thing that used to be called Twitter and Instagram and threads and YouTube. We are there all at rebingeit. You can join the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. There's been a lot of chatter there lately on yes. Voyager. A little bit more activity there, which is nice. Yeah, come on down, join the group, 
chat with other Trek nerds. Yeah, we're not super fast on Facebook. We're not super fast on anything because we got <laughs> other things going on, but we do respond. Yes. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs>